Welcome to Global Perspectives. How important is civility in today's world? More important than ever, according to Ambassador Harriet Elam Thomas, author of Diversifying Diplomacy. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Harriet. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I almost don't know where to start because this issue is so broad, mm -hmm. but why don't we start in a, in a very general way about the importance of civility as we've known it in the past and what is happening today. Maybe tell us your impressions about that aspect of the issue. From the time I was a child, it was important to say please and thank you. And then became, becoming a diplomat, I found that it was even more important to give respect and honor to a new culture wherever I was assigned abroad. But I have my parents to thank for teaching me the importance of being polite, listening attentively, and not assuming what someone else is going to say, but speaking to them in a very kind and respectful, to my interlocutors, in a very respectful manner. The other day I was talking to someone who respects you tremendously, who said that you epitomize civility. So when, when you enter the room, civility has arrived. And um, I, I said her ears must be burning, hopefully in a positive way. But, uh, but w what does that mean when it's so obvious that you exude civility that, that people notice? I've been told often that I talk to everyone, whether it's the cleaning person in the office or in the embassies or whether it is the universities, presidents or the ambassadors when I was a junior diplomat. But we're all human beings and the fact that I had time in the White House way back when, I learned that we all are very simple in terms of our needs and wants to communicate with one another. And if I did that, giving eye contact, speaking with again, sincerity, knowing a little bit about the history or the background of the person I was going to meet, made all the difference in the world. Your book, Diversifying Diplomacy, talks about your life experience, your diplomatic experience, your academic experience. You have so many things rolled into one uh, volume. But where, where did all of this start? You talked about the, the civility that you learned from, uh, from your parents. Uh, how did you first contemplate getting into the diplomatic world, if you will? I was an exchange student in my junior year in college, and I was accepted as a young woman of color in a place that didn't seem to care what I looked like and accepted me as a human being. I had grown up in Roxbury, Massachusetts in the late 50s, early 60s, where that was not the case. I was respected and evidently liked because I was open and willing to communicate with them in the French language. So I think that learning another language helped me become far more sensitive to a culture because in so doing I was giving honor to them and respect to them. Again, the word respect comes up. And I often think of Mandela's quote, if you speak to a person in a language he or she knows, you speak to his head. But if you speak to a person in their own language, you speak to their heart. Implicit in that quote is civility. Civility. Can you return to the very moment that you arrived in France? What was going through your mind? And what was your reaction as to how you were received? And what was it what you imagined it to be based on what you had read? None of any of the things that I imagined, in, based on what I had read, transpired. And of course, if you remember, in the late 60s, early 60s, this was 1962, there wasn't an internet. I had the World Book Encyclopedia. So I did a lot of reading about France, and I knew about the way American soldiers, who were uh, African-American soldiers, Negroes at that time, had been treated very positively. I knew that a lot of artists and writers went to France to continue their creative work because they were accepted for their work and not the color of their skin. So I had that as a background, but I had no idea that no one would look at me twice when I walked down the street. I felt a kind of freedom that I didn't feel in Roxbury, Massachusetts. So after that experience, did you start to form in your mind the idea that 
your career might be international, or did that come later? It was after that experience. Because I came back to the United States and I said that I perhaps presented to my community in Bron, France, outside of Lyon, um, a picture of America, that, of, of a part of America that they had never seen or imagined. Uh, the media at that time was television, the major media, and the images were not very positive about any minority or any woman on television. 90210 was very popular. All of the television programs that were inexpensive to disseminate were shown abroad. And that, as a result, there were significant stereotypes about women and minorities. And, and I found that people were just curious to know what my family was like, what it was like growing up in Boston. And I realized that perhaps if I became a career diplomat, I could help change the image of America abroad. So you go into the field of diplomacy. What not was, directly. Not, not directly, but we, we could spend a lot of time talking about how you got there, but I think in the interest of time for mm -hmm. this show, anyway, we should jump into your first diplomatic experience. How, how did that happen? Um, again, these things are complicated, and I'm sure it wasn't a straight path. No, but there were advisors, and all of my advisors and those who were mentors at that time were white males who saw something in this little girl of color that they wanted to polish. And one boss, Richard Arndt, said, you need to be a cultural attache in our embassies abroad. You're well read, you know the arts. And before I knew it, I took the foreign service exam after being prepped by four men of color who were determined that I would get through the oral part of the exam, which is usually very difficult. Uh, I read the New York Times, I read the major media and foreign policy magazines so that I was up to date on the issues of that particular period. This is 1971. And I passed it. And my first overseas assignment was as a junior diplomat as the assistant cultural attache in Dakar, Senegal. How fortunate I was. And then eventually, much later in your career, you, you years went later, back to I the went same back country. To be ambassador. <laughs> to be ambassador. Those are those are all great stories. Mm -hmm. But since our primary subject today is is civility, why, why don't we shift to that? Mm -hmm. uh, we have had turbulent periods in our nation's history. I'm sure we will have turbulent periods in the future. We're going through one of them today. And civility seems to be forgotten in most conversations. Something as simple as driving down the street can often result in a, in a complicated if mess if there's an argument, if somebody questions a turn or whatever, and before you know it, there are people are shouting. Sometimes people are shot. Mm. Uh, and, and this, I think, is shocking to many who, who witness these developments, especially in other countries, and then they wonder what's going on in America. But the incivility that we're experiencing, I believe, because I look worldwide and I see a lot of it everywhere. It's not the world that we grew up in and in which civility had its place. Upon reflection, I would say that the economic s situation worldwide, the political situation worldwide, puts incredible stress on relationships. And while we know relationships are important in every culture, in every society, and they must be based on trust. But if you're already threatened in terms of your livelihood, in terms of raising your family, uh, how are you going to be able to educate them, and you're feeling that you're not having a fair chance to do that. Children enter universities, even state institutions around the country, and leave with horrendous college debt, tuition debt. So those stresses add to the absence, I think, of being polite. Uh, parents, uh, children are having children, so to speak. And so there isn't that one, two, or three generations in a household that could reinforce the kinds of things that perhaps you and I grew up with. You don't disrespect your elders. You always defer to them. You don't make faces. You don't respond 
in, without politeness. Our society now encourages first names. People call their professors by their first names. Most cultures around the world are still very, very tied to the civility of the discussion, whether it's in a negotiating session or whether it is a teaching session. Teachers and their students, there's a sort of line that you do not cross. And why has that experience eroded? Is it something that people have done consciously? Did it just happen? I is, will, it, is it new technology? Social I believe media? the new technology has much to do with it. Uh, because I didn't see this in the late 90s, early 2000s, before we had the internet. And so you had to interact with your teacher to do research. You had to go to the library and talk with a librarian. You had to ferret out information on the three by five cards. And you relied on another human being to help you do your research. Now you can do that independently and pretty effectively. And you don't have to develop those social skills to, to even approach your professor in a manner that lets him or her know that you're sincerely interested in increasing your knowledge. You do it in front of a machine. And what does that mean? You, you don't have to com really communicate in a, any fashion. I, I don't see people saying, excuse me, at a theater, at the Kennedy Center, or in, at the, anywhere in performing arts centers around the world. It's not just in the United States. And I, I find that a bit odd, but it's because if you're walking around with a machine, a tiny iPhone or a smartphone in your hand, you can really touch the world in a positive or a negative way without batting an eye or having to smile or to grimace. And, and how does that reliance on social media affect the way we interact more generally in, in terms of speaking with other people and our interactions in daily life? Uh, I, I've seen people literally texting each other over dinner and they're at the same dinner table. And I this is a strange phenomenon to me. It's very strange. I didn't think it really existed. People like you mentioned that to me. And so I became a little more observant when I went to restaurants. And I thought it was absolutely ludicrous that you're sitting next to another human being and you don't turn to them to ask or say something that you found interesting that you've even read on this little gadget. Uh, you don't have to choose your words carefully any longer because you have the anonymity of communication so you can be pretty harsh and as a result you have children taking their lives because they've been bullied on the internet that's the most sobering aspect uh, I'm sure there's political discourse that and social discourse that is not at all positive but to think a child cannot handle how he or she is treated because of something that was on a text is frightening uh, I think that that is, again, one of the reasons why we have lost the ability to be polite and to take time and listen to others when they're speaking. Exactly. You've had the opportunity to present at nationally regarded forums on civility, including in Stamford, Connecticut, mm -hmm. recently. Tell us about that experience. What, what was the origin of their civility series and why did they seek you out as a participant? I was quite surprised. Um, I sit on the board of the Institute of International Education and one of the board members is Bob Dylan Schneider who, is, who has a partnership with the Hearst Publication Company and was formerly the CEO of Hill & Noten. And he said, I'd like you to come up and talk to our civility series. He was extremely supportive of the memoir. And when I met him nine years ago, I saw something in this man that told me he was concerned about America's history, its culture, and its actual impact on the world. And I, I, I was flabbergasted at the invitation, and I was delighted to accept, especially since I was speaking after 
cabinet members of this and other member other administrations on that subject. When I walked into the room, I saw, yes, a number of people who love libraries and who love books, but I also saw young people who were Fulbright scholars, who were anxious to come and hear somebody who had had an overseas experience, who were learning about their programs in the United States that could be enhanced by their exposure at NYU and at Yale. And then there were members who were former diplomats in the audience, retired military, but a number of private citizens who truly are truly interested in having a more civil society. That was refreshing because you don't see that. And of course, you knew about it, but did that meet the front pages of the newspapers? I doubt it. So what, what was the main message that you delivered to that audience? That in our foreign affairs, and we cannot be effective if we do not approach our allies and our enemies with respect and civility. That will, and it happens if in fact you have the knowledge of a language and you break down that barrier you will be invited to their homes if you go and work at an embassy abroad. Always remember that you are a guest in that country. It may be that you re represent the United States of America, the 800 pound gorilla in the world, but you will also have to remember you must be a polite guest in that nation. And that was the message I was delivering to the audience. They asked questions about what it was like to be abroad as a person of color and what kinds of questions did I get. And it was a pleasure to respond to them when I could be totally candid about the fact that I made it my business not to be provocative whenever I responded to questions that I didn't like about America, that they were asking me about my country. And I'm terribly patriotic, even more so when I'm abroad than when you're at home. No one wants to hear their country disrespected. But in order for me to have credibility, I had to show respect to them by knowing the issues that were important to them that America was facing with that country in the bilateral relationship. What is the biggest challenge to you and what has been the biggest challenge in understanding another culture so that you can reach that point where you're not being disrespectful and so because so, some cultures are more complicated than others and you can't understand them in a day or a month. I didn't early on. I made several faux pas but I learned that I couldn't superimpose my values on another country. In each embassy we have what is called the Foreign Service Nationals, now referred to as locally engaged staff. They are the lifeblood of every American embassy abroad. They know where all the dead bodies lie. They know where you are coming from because they've done research on you before you get there. So if you want to have an effective assignment in country X, Y, or Z, you are going to have to work very hard to have them in your corner. You don't do what this young diplomat who thought at 33 she knew it all, and invite men and women to a meeting, including the driver, thinking you were being your democratic self. And you're told later by Sorbonne graduates, I don't sit in a room with a driver. Why did you do that? It was very hard for me to understand that, but I also learned that I was trying to be a little too civil and I didn't understand the societal and idiosyncrasies that I needed to know to be effective. So I learned not to do that. This was early on in my career. Or I had to work very hard to convince the embassy to send a journalist who was anti-American in his writing to the United States. I said, we don't want to send people who already love America. I'm not sure that he'll come back and be very balanced in his writing, but he will have been able to see how journalism works in the U.S. 
I must say it was a pleasure to see how he wrote upon his return. It wasn't always pro-America, but it was far more balanced than it had been in the past. I've been told that you're especially adept at breaking down in civility when, when you encounter it. Um, has that become more challenging with the passage of time? And have you encountered any situations, without getting into specifics as to countries and people, where uh, you encountered incivility and maybe weren't successful? I can honestly say that it's very hard for someone to come back at you if you respond quietly and with a smile, and you are non-judgmental in your response to a question they pose or a position they take. And at least we have to be willing to be open to hear that position before making a judgment. It's not easy, I'll be honest with you. I haven't been successful always. But I think that it's, it's easy for me, easier for me to diminish that anger level because I'm not going to raise my voice. Very often it's the way the manner, the message is delivered, the tone of voice and the body language that will bring you the effect that you want, even though the, your, your, the person with whom you're engaging in this conversation is terribly angry about something America has done. But it takes a lot of studying of the culture, uh, learning a lot about what makes that person tick, and you have a staff that's going to help you do that. Um, I will not go to a lunch or a dinner without having background on the persons I'm going to meet because I don't want to be caught off guard. So preparation is important, but again, delivering the message in a kind and respectful manner, even if it may not be what they want to hear. So wh where do we go from this point? Are we destined, at least for the moment, to live in a world of incivility? Do you feel that the pendulum will swing back to a more comfortable place at some point? Or do you I suspect do. this will be a, a, a longer term problem? I think that it will take time, much more time than I may have on the planet, because we've become so tied to instant information gaining what we want to know. Instant gratification is something that I used to talk about in classes around the world. Uh, and America is the worst for always wanting the answer yesterday, not right now. Most societies are far more patient than we are because they've had challenges economically. They may not have the same technological advancements, uh, except in Asia, of course, and certain parts of India. but. If we are at least willing to communicate within a family structure, holidays are coming up. Important Jewish holidays, important Christian holidays at the end of the year. If we could at least leave religion, politics out of the discussion, that's the first step. And then in our public discourse, we never want to go to the level of being impolite in front of a camera. I think that's the worst thing you could do. No matter what someone says to disrespect you, do not let your anger show. Because it really disarms the person who is trying to hurt you. And if, if you do respond the, the moment in an angry way, the moment is captured. On the news or for wherever, all time. For, for all time. I remember Gwen Eiffel saying that people called her ugly words, and she just smiled. And I thought, oh my heavens, how could she do that? But I could see why she was such a respected journalist for doing that. Obviously, responsibility falls to all of us Absolutely. to take a role in uh, dealing with incivility. But t t talk about the role of young people in particular, because uh, we know that the next generation is going to be running things and engaging across the board in, in a not too distant future, what can they do now to start thinking about ways that they might combat incivility? First of all, John, I will say that the young people that I've met teaching in universities are all far from the stereotype of the 
insensitive millennials. I have never been so impressed at their concern about their fellow man, um, human trafficking. They will be civil to people that I might not have been civil to when I was growing up. They're far more tolerant about intermarriages, intergenerational interactions, and same-sex relationships. I am truly impressed with what I have observed in my travels around this country. That said, that's not the, again, you won't see that much of the positive aspects. You saw it in Parkland, and that was so encouraging. But I wonder if, in fact, um, we should, we as professors, should constantly remind our students that no matter how intelligent you are, you always have to be concerned about the least of these, your brothers and sisters. And if we do that in addition to our academic lessons, I do think it will resonate. I truly do. And so you anticipate a world, perhaps in the not too distant future, where civility will reign again? I do, I do. Because I'm not the only one who finds this extremely important. There are a lot of other professors and a lot of other leaders who are truly committed to being civil. Well, on that note, I would like to thank you, Ambassador Harriet Elam Thomas, for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. It's a very special pleasure for me. I thank you. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.